FACTS is the facial action coding system. It's a comprehensive anatomically based system for describing all observable facial movement. And if you unpack that sentence, what that means is it's something we use where we look at the face from the outside, so the human observer. Um, now we have computerized systems that can do some of this, but that's another conversation. But the human observer will look at a face and note appearance changes, creases, folds, act movement of features, brows going up and down, lip corners lifting, furrows forming, and those are signs, in addition to just simply observing movement, that certain muscles have contracted. For, for example, when I lift my brow like this, I'm, I'm using the frontalis muscle that lifts up here. You see all these, this folded skin, my brows are higher. That's a sign that the muscle has contracted that we can see from the outside. So fax uses these outside features and the observance of movement or the observation of movement as a basis for determining which muscles have moved. In fact, the language, the components of facial movement are called action units or AU. And an action unit is the observable effects of a certain muscle or group of muscles firing or contracting. There's a one-to-one, -one, a roughly one-to-one -one correspondence between each action unit and the underlying muscle group, but there are certain muscle groups that do more than one action, depending on what part of it contracts. So take, for example, frontalis muscle. This is a large set of fibers in the brow. If I fully contract frontalis, my whole brow is lifted. And some of the signs of that are the lines running across the forehead, the fact that the brows are actually higher, this area underneath the eyebrow is stretched out. However, there's actually two separate actions um, that correspond to different portions of frontalis that create the brow lift. There's action unit one, which raises the inner corners of the brow. And you see when one contracts, there are short horizontal wrinkles here, the inner corners of the brow are made more oblique. That's one. There's also two. Two lifts the outer corners of the brow like that. And the lines are this way. When you put one and two together, the whole brow is lifted. So you can fully describe any observable facial action with these action units. There's about 44 action units and then, you know, almost innumerable combinations among them. And with these, we can describe everything that the face can do, or at least everything that's observable from the outside. FACTS does not measure unobservable muscle action like electromyography can. The reason behind having something that's anatomically based is when Ekman and Friesen, Paul Ekman and Wallace Friesen, who developed facts and it was originally published in 1978, what they were trying to do was create some kind of objective system for measuring facial movement from the outside. They were originally inspired uh, by their work in facial expressions of emotion. The studies they'd done cross-culturally that found in spite of quite a few cultural differences, there seemed to be a few core expressions for what are often known as basic emotions um, that seem to have a similar morphology across really varied cultures, which suggested that there was something about the face that it might be a big good tool for learning about emotion. And unlike other attempts that had been made to measure facial expressions of emotion, which prescribed certain patterns like, oh, if the brows do this and the lips do this, then it's this emotion. If we see this, it's sadness. If we see this, it's anger. Those are systems that require, you know, we call them template-based, they're selective. You're looking for this kind of um, configuration. If you see it, that's an anger. If you see this, that's a fear. The problem is a system like that doesn't allow you to uncover patterns of action that you didn't pause in advance. What if there's this unusual configuration that we didn't know might occur with a certain emotion? If we didn't predict it ahead of time, we'd miss it with a selective system. 
So they realized they had to be more ethological and objective and simply describe behavior and just see what the face does in a variety of situations. And then we can get a sense of what combinations of actions or facial configurations, or we sometimes call them displays, what patterns seem to correspond to different psychological states. That was the impetus for the development of facts. That was the motivation to go to such lengths to do an anatomically based system. Well, I mentioned the tradition of people in the behavioral sciences or psychology who study emotion or other psychological states, and they might want to get some other indicator of what people may be going through emotionally that you can't get from people's self-reports of experience. You wanna augment um, that with uh, a measure that doesn't require them to present themselves in a certain way. Facial expression can be um, helpful in catching things that people either don't wanna share with you or don't intend, you know, don't even know they're sharing with you. It is also, so it's used in the psychological sciences, the social sciences to measure emotion. Um, but the key thing to remember about facts is facts only codes action units. It simply tells you which muscles contracted. It doesn't tell you what that means. It's up to the researcher to do uh, a study where it's corresponding with other indicators of emotion, what people say they're feeling, what their physiology is doing, what situation they're in. And then from that kind of comprehensive picture, we can get a sense of where they might, going, might be going through emotionally. So that's sort of a basic research application, only one, a very traditional one. But some people use facts for entirely different reasons. In fact, more recently, it's become very, very popular in the work of digital effects and facial animation because by quantifying or describing um, what muscular actions move and giving basically a language for, oh, let's have the cheeks do this, the eyebrows do this, the chin does this, it's sort of a way of describing and giving instruction for facial movement and facial configuration that has become really the gold standard in facial animation and digital effects and film. So quite a number of people who learn facts do it for that application as well. So you have the psychological sciences, social sciences, you have computer digital effects. There's also people who learn it not to actually code or design with it, but because they want to go through the process of learning it to make them more sensitive to nonverbal behavior. And in this case, I'm talking about people like um, who are interrogators, law enforcement. That's been kind of a surprising application of FACTS. FACTS was designed to be self-instructional and Ekman and Friesen originally published the, the manual in 1978. It was um, brought into digital format uh, by Joe Hager. So Ekman, Friesen, and Hager, 2002. Currently, the time of this video, which is um, early 2020, that is the most current version of the fax manual. And it's designed to be fully self-instructional, but it requires reading very dense text, looking at visual examples, learning how to code. Actually, learning how to code is a crucial and necessary part of learning facts. You can't just read about it, you have to learn how to do it. It's like the difference between reading about a musical piece and learning how to play it. So you really have to learn how to code, even if your work is to design with facts. You can't really learn it without learning how to code. And you can do it all with the manual on your own. It takes a lot of discipline and at least 100 hours of self-study. I, um, back in 2004 actually, developed the five-day workshop where I take people through the facts manual. I'm there kind of moving them along. They're working as a group and individually, and they have expert advice, mine, and they um, can get through the entire manual in uh, four and a half days. And then um, it takes a lot of homework. We have quizzes. It's, it's a lot of time, but it's, a, it's an accelerated format for learning facts that's also really in-depth, really intense. And the whole point of that is to prepare people to take the final test for, for proficiency. And um, just to say something about the facts final test for, for proficiency, whether you learn on your own or you learn with a workshop, the only way to have some kind of marker of whether you really learned this correctly, are you accurate when you um, do your facts coding, 
is to take this final test, which has a number of video clips or coded by a group of experts. And uh, each person does this. It's right now administered online through Paul Ekman's website. And you um, really just test your ability to code these very, you know, a number of different AUs that appear in over like, it's like 34 different video examples. And then your codes are compared to um, the expert codes. And if you go above a certain criterion, you're regarded as proficient. So whether you plan to actually code in your work, if you're a researcher or use it in design or use it to even improve your interpersonal skills, the only thing that we currently have that's regarded as a stamp that you really know this is the proficiency test. So taking the facts final test is an important piece of the educational process.